2.3 trillion dollars. That is the value of student debt in the United States of America as of 2022. This is debt that cripples people, traps them for life in a cycle of having to pay and ruins their ability to access other outcomes or opportunities because of the inability to access loans as a result of bad credit. All of this because people are sold a lie based on how much their degree is actually worth. It is only in a world where you don't precondition people's ability to access an education on their ability to pay upfront that you break this cycle. That is why we propose. Few key points of setup before counterfactual and argumentation. Firstly, I want to make it clear in status quo, the necessity of university as a precursor for accessing a job. There are two reasons here. Firstly, in terms of competition, because of a large degree of access to education in the status quo, a uni degree is no longer an outlier, but a necessity or the norm. In the United States by 2030, it's estimated that 98% of the workforce will have a university degree. The second reason why it's a necessity is that the types of jobs which people have now demand higher skill and require a degree because people very rarely now work in lower skill jobs because automation has phased that out. We're talking about jobs in the tertiary and quaternary sector that require a university education. The problem then in status quo is that even when people can't afford going to university, they have to go to university because it is a form of insurance for your life and ensuring that you are unemployed. And thus they are driven into debt. This is also in a world where scholarships will always be scarce because of the funding of universities is often insufficient. What then is our counterfactual? Our world is one where universities would charge you a fixed percentage of your total earnings after you graduate. This would be the same for all uni university graduates in all fields. Secondly, it would be a set period of time and the same time period for everyone. For example, this could look like 5% of your income for 10 years after you graduate for everyone. This would be paid annually. So as your income changes, the amount you pay changes, different people would thus pay different amounts based on how much they are earning. Right. Two arguments from Prop 1. Before that, I'll take a POI. You can't say that you will have a fixed amount of years after you graduate for you to pay this proportion of your income because this kind of system is already happening in the status quo where this payment is happening indefinitely, for example, Purdue. But that's not one that I don't know if that's actually true. And that's how most or if not all universities work. And second, it's about a preference, right? So your one, your the world is one where you have to support people paying for their college upfront, either through loans or not. Our side is one where you pay, pay based on the income you've already earned. Of course, we can have a system with a set number of years. That's not something that's excluded. First argument as to why we better the student debt crisis on our side of the house. In status quo, the problem with universities is that the price of your degree doesn't reflect how much you are going to earn after graduation, i.e. it doesn't reflect the market value of your degree. This is because universities have an incentive to get you to pay more than your degree is actually worth. This is for three reasons. One, they can bank on other things other, on things other than employment as a reason for you employing uh, rather applying to that university. Prestige and how big their brand name is. Important alumni that they're able to leverage in advertising. Advertising the university life and experience is something that is important. Advertising things like campus aesthetics, all are things they're able to use to get people to join. The second reason is that they deliberately obscure data of degrees with pure job prospects. Either they don't collect data from their graduates, but even if they do, they are able to obscure it in advertising. Because in advertising, you won't focus on that statistic. You'll do things like focus on an interview with a few rich alumni that you're able to use to convince people to join. The third reason is that students are irrational. They're often young and impressionable. And even if they're going into a bad field, they are likely to believe that they will be the exception. If I am going into the field of philosophy, I believe that I will be the philosopher who makes a huge discovery and do better. We think of ourselves and as better than we actually are. 
what this means is that people are forced to pay a lot more money than they should be and most people likely have to take loans and go into debt in order to afford university the costs of this compound over time and most people are unlikely to be able to pay it as a result of interest as well this is a horrible issue for the vast majority of people in the united states people have to pay thousands of dollars every month just to cover the interest on their loans it cripples their ability to have a good life and meet a solid standard of living and actualize themselves. We solve this on our side of the house because we are not forced to pay more than the market value than the degree. Even if you, like, you never have to go into debt because it's taken out of money that you already have rather than based on circulation. The second thing we do is that we change the incentives of universities because you can no longer base advertising on other factors, but rather based on how much people will earn post-graduation because that is now the main source of income for universities. We allow, we thus allow people to make more informed choices because we give them the information that is the most important to them making that choice. And two, universities are more likely to do things like improve post-graduation employment prospects to meet this, allowing things like internships, capstone programs, allowing for things like job fairs and connections into the market, doing things like CV distribution programs where you give the university your curriculum vitae and they give it to as many, as many job opportunities as possible. The upshot of this argument is that we are able to solve the debt crisis on our side of the house, which harms the life of the vast majority of people in status quo. Second argument as to why we improve access to universities on our side of the house. The problem with status quo is that the high upfront cost makes university unaffordable for a lot of people if they don't go into debt. As a result, poor people are deterred from applying to university. If you have a bad credit score, for example, you can't access a loan in order to go to university. There's also often a lack of access to scholarships because of the high cost that most universities have in terms of paying faculty, taking care of facilities, housing, food, etc. You are not deterred on our side of the house because you do not have to pay upfront and pay purely based on what you already have once you graduate. The second problem on their side of the house is that many people have to drop out of university even if they get in for a bunch of different scenarios. I'm going to give you examples as to what this looks like. If you have a breadwinner who gets unemployed in the middle of your university career, you have to drop out because they can no longer pay for you. If your family business shuts down because of the COVID pandemic, you need to drop out of university because your parents no longer have the money to pay for you. In countries like Sri Lanka, the economic shock and inflation crisis means that people can no longer afford university and are dropping out. This is the status quo. How do we solve this on our side of the house? More people are able to afford university because it is paid off of what you earn in the future. This is better for society because we get a more qualified workforce in terms of giving more people access to university because they are not deterred and don't have to drop out. Second, people can apply to better universities with better facilities rather than just cheaper universities. In status quo, you're forced to apply to universities that you can only, only universities that you can afford. Whereas on our side, that is no longer a barrier and you can apply to universities that will actually take you. As a skilled person from a poor background in status quo, you are forced to compromise on your potential university prospects because of the fact that you are poor. We eliminate that on our side of the house. The third thing we do is prevent cyclical poverty. This is because in status quo, if you are poor and can't go to university, you will have to take a lower paying job. Your kids will also be poorer and they also cannot go to university. It is only on our side that we break that cycle. The conclusion of this argument is that more people get access to university on our side of the house and university fulfills its goal because it provides access to education for substantially more people, bettering the lives of millions, only on proposition. Propose. I thank the speaker for their fine speech and would now like to invite the honorable leader of opposition. Here, here. Hi. Uh, just a reminder that I want POIs verbal, please. Thank you. So if everyone's ready, I'll begin my speech in three, two, one. $2.3 trillion might be the debt that exists, but that doesn't actually change in the proposition. 
What does change is schools choosing upfront talent over potential. You don't allow individuals who are marginalized in society to get in because colleges definitely don't want to take the risk of possibly not getting the money that they wanted or the upfront cost they probably would have had to pay under status quo back because they aren't able to succeed in the future. Unfortunately, they destroy the opportunities for the people to get in that they wish to get in in the first place. We say that is why we're supposed to stand on opposition. I'm only doing a couple of things. First, a couple points of rebuttals. Second, on our team stands. Third, the burden for proposition. And then we're going to forward two arguments in my speech. First argument on why propositions model drastically decreases the opportunities from minorities to get into colleges. Second argument on how you deteriorate the quality of college, uh, education. And third argument, which is going to be proposed by Justin, which is why how the majority of the students are going to be pushed to pay a higher price for education. Before all of that, though, let's go into a couple points of rebuttals. The six minutes that Ashwin like mainly spends on like his arguments is that the price of a degree doesn't reflect the market value. Universities want you to pay more, right? We have three responses. First, I don't think that all the things they note are arbitrary factors that the universities just use to make you pay more. Things like campus life is similar to a vacation or a hotel where the environment is the price you pay. Things like a brand name matters quite a lot when it comes to job employment, right? Because it's a proven standard. More scientific facilities are, are really expensive. You're paying to use the up-to-date tools to conduct your high quality research. We think all of this contributes to your success. That's the price you pay upfront. Second, you might not be forced to pay the market value, but you probably are going to be forced to pay a whole lot more, right? I just want to know how problematic problems model is because you don't pay the upfront cost you pay the full cost and possibly more if it's endless and it's continuous like after you graduate and you continuously take away a percentage of your income especially if you earn maybe like 100k per year you probably have to pay quite a lot of percentages right if you don't get a high income you still pay more and more over time over the upfront cost because eventually colleges might are still going to be profit oriented they want to make sure they're getting as much money out of you as possible but third we think career-oriented consulting already exists but if a university truly cares about profit like we told you, but especially within private universities and the top universities, I would say it's probably easier for them to just pick people with a high chance of success who apply to these universities rather than invest into like a ton of money into different consultants and like hire all these consultants to come help their uh, career oriented oriented students right. at the end of the day. That's probably far more expensive than just picking students who have a high chance of success with a proven record. I'm not going to take that at this point. I'll take it a little bit later. They tell you then that the cycle of poverty continues on the R side and they're able to break this because more people go to college. Well, we tell you is that no, not more, like as much people go to college under your side of the house, because now the colleges are the ones who invest into students. They are the ones who take all the risks, which means they have much more of a higher incentive to not be taking risks, especially when picking students. They want to make sure they have a proven record. Our stance is this debate is simple. Universities should not be the ones who invest looking at the prospects of their students. We support the status quo where schools are much more diverse and ambitious, allowing students a chance to actually get into the schools, no matter their background. We have two versions for proposition. First, they must justify fueling colleges of profit-based incentives in terms of prioritizing accepting students whom the colleges think will be able to earn the most in the future. Second, they must justify colleges not being able to predict their reserve of monetary resources as accurately as the status quo and therefore not being able to make the most efficient use of the resources. Moving on to our first argument then on why props model drastically decreases the opportunities yeah. for the marginalized. The premise of this argument is that proposition forces colleges to focus on accepting students with the highest percentage of success and proven historical record. Why is it hard? Understand that most colleges, especially top ones, are profit oriented. The more successful and bigger the college, the more prestigious, also means the more money they have to spend on education, means they also need to care about the possible success of the students, especially since they probably don't want the amount of money they are able to use in terms of increasing quality of education to fluctuate year by year. This means that they need to make sure they're making the absolute return on investment into the students they pick. However, if the tuition were to be free, what they need to focus on isn't the potential talent, but rather the proven records and guarantee of monetary return. Why is this? Two things to note. First, considering the fact that students who get scholarships will still get them and attend under both sides of the house, what's important to consider are the students who don't get a full ride and need to pay the upfront cost. The problem here is that while students invest in colleges under our side, it's flipped on prop where colleges invest in students. Under our side, students invest in college, pay the upfront cost in order to gain a step up through college and possibly succeed in the future. Under prop, colleges invest in students to make sure they receive the absolute gains and profits off of the students they select, meaning they're unlikely to take the risks. But second, what happens when colleges are the ones investing in students. Since they don't receive the upfront profit of the tuition fee like in the status quo, they are now less incentivized to take risks when making acceptance decisions and are more likely to invest in a proven record. This means if you come from a rich family and your family has connections in the business world, you're probably more likely to succeed and have a good stable job. So the college would probably
fully accept you no matter what. Even if you were talented though, but didn't have the opportunity to sign shine due to financial issues, colleges are that much less likely to accept you because they don't want to take that risk of just blowing hundreds of thousands of dollars away because you could have paid in the upfront cost. Marginalized students are the ones who usually aren't able to access the opportunity to prove a show, to prove a record, right? They can't get access to things like backdoor internships at large firms or extracurricular activities that display their wealth, like playing upper level tennis or golf or playing an instrument for years. It's much harder with marginalized students to get in when colleges are the ones with power, ones holding all the risk. What happens in the status quo then? Means colleges will take in, will still take in like marginalized students on our side. Even if these students can't pay up all this tuition straight up, these colleges just collect the student loans from the right now. Uh -huh. So it's a profit-based incentive. Colleges have no reason to be worried about accepting marginalized students because they know that they will get the full amount of tuition from them anyways. Why is this important? Their side majorly stops marginalized students from being even able to get into these universities in the first place, effectively cutting education from the roots and making it unavailable to these individuals to climb the social ladder. The comparative is at least giving these students education along with subsidizing measures such as student loans or scholarships. The weighing here is important. Even if some people do get a good job because they pass the barrier of payment, you restrict everyone else from the most vulnerable, larger like poor, from getting an opportunity to get a stable income or good job to begin with because colleges don't want to take this risk. Before I move on to my second argument, though, I'll take that. Universities don't have to care as much about merit now because they don't depend on the employability of students. Given that merit is something that bypasses racial and ethnic barriers, why is it such a bad thing if universities pick on the basis of merit? The bad thing is that under your side of the house, the merit is unable to be proven by the marginalized group within status quo. Like, presumably, if you don't have the amount of financial resources to get into these top competitions, you can't have a proven record, even if you're that talented. Under our side, if you have the proven record, you're getting in, that's the difference. Second argument on how, how this deteriorates the quality of education. First layer on the shaky status of university funds. Because on their side, university capital inevitably heavily fluctuates depending on the income status of the students that year, right? This means that universities don't have an insured amount of money to grow invest in the long term. This means two things. First, you might have no plans for the future, which means you end up saving quality of education average goes down for these universities. E.g., universities are less likely to take on large-scale investments that really benefit their own students, things like infrastructure, good professors. But second, they might just like probably force graduates to pay more in terms of the portion of income or longevity. They're feeding the purpose of government policy because they might tell you that they're just going to like make them pay 5%. We think it's going to depend from school to school, right? That means that this is especially true for prestigious universities, which means that they'll exponentially increase scouting from the very top. But second layer of analysis is how there's going to be excessive focus on practical academias, right? We think in order to maximize profits and funds, universities will try to maximize student employment at high income at all costs. This means drastic decreasing of the diversity of education and will only pay attention to jobs that make money in status quo. E.g., things like liberal arts schools, art majors will not be focused upon. Majors like STEM will probably be much more preferred. This is enhanced due to the first analysis we gave you. The moment the university starts cutting down on spending, the first victim will be within these phases fields. Why is this bad? Because you lose the quality of education in general, leading to the generations of less competent graduates who get less high paying jobs, or students lose critical thinking skills and important thoughts of morality and ethics that comes with studying the humanities and social sciences. Even if you wanted to become a politician, you probably don't get the resources to go to top universities because they probably want to make sure that they're getting as much money from the STEM field. For these reasons, extremely proud to stand on up. I thank the speaker for that fine speech. And would now like to call upon the Honorable DPN. Here, here. Uh, hi. Uh, just to clarify, um, for speak of side proposition uses they them pronouns. Uh, we're not going to make a big deal out of this or anything, but just want to remind the house. Hi, can everybody hear me? Yeah, you're perfectly audible. Thank you. Uh, I'd like peers in chat, please.
Three things in this speech. First, on increasing access to university education. Second, on reducing student debt. Thirdly, on improving the academic culture within universities, which will also be my substantive. First, on increasing access to university education. I want to make a big clarification about what our model was in first, because opposition seems to have misunderstood it. Our claim was never that tuition costs will remain fixed and that people will be forced to pay that tuition cost as debt once they have earned a job as a proportion of their income. Our argument was rather that there will be no fixed cost within a degree for how much each individual has to pay that the university says that you must pay within your lifetime. It will be the case, as they concede in their second argument, and as is apparently clear in our first speech, that you set a fixed percentage within a fixed time, and that is all the university can ever charge you for your degree. Now, we can see that this may mean that across different degrees or within the same degree itself, different people end up paying different amounts. But we think that that is beneficial because it fixes the incentives of universities to give better degrees and more employable degrees to the most vulnerable students. So to be clear, on our side of the house, there is no fixed tuition cost. You only end up paying what you pay within that fixed time period as a proportion of the income that you earn. This leads me to direct responses. The biggest push from the opposition in this clash is that we will not allow marginalized students into university because they aren't able to prove that they will be successful and get higher paying jobs. Three areas of response. Firstly, I would argue that merit-based admissions are more likely on our side of the house. This is because even students from marginalized backgrounds, such as racial minorities or poorer students, have the capacity to succeed once they enter prestigious or even well-established universities that give them a valuable degree that allows them to enter the workforce. So saying that you can't prove that you are a qualified individual before you attend university isn't a barrier that prevents universities from trying to determine, based on the available opportunities, whether you are likely to be successful in university. So on the comparative, we think that universities have a greater capacity to look beyond the limitations of money that poorer students might face and see what they have managed to do with their limited opportunities, which means that there is a greater incentive to engage in merit-based admissions because you know once the student enters university, they have access to all of the opportunities for things like career advancement and the same degree as they are contemporaries and peers, which means that they are more likely to be successful. So you cut across racial and poverty-based barriers. Secondly, I would point out that on their side of the house, merit-based admissions are less likely. This is because you have an incentive to take in the students, not the students who are most likely to succeed after they leave university with their undergraduate degree and get a high paying job, but the students who are most capable of proving that they will be able to cover the cost of tuition upfront. This means the rich children of alumni that are able to prove that they can pay the entire cost of their tuition within a fixed period of time are more likely to get into university in the world of the proposition, because these are the students that can demonstrate that they can pay the cost of university. Secondly, I want to weigh between these two points. Because on their side of the house, the underlying assumption is that if you eliminate this model, marginalized students can get into university anyway. If what they say is true, and marginalized students lack the money to be able to demonstrate that they have skills that will make them successful in the workplace, then surely they also lack the money to be able to prove that they will be able to pay for university. Most poorer families have terrible credit scores, which means that they're not even able to get student loans unless they're at incredibly high interest rates. Comparatively, your ability to pay for things like extracurricular activities, or even to go to a slightly better school that gives you more opportunities to prove your academic excellence is comparatively greater. So if the way up is between on which side of the house we give more opportunities to marginalized students, a world in which they're able to control their merit is far greater than their ability to pay for university upfront. Thirdly, I would point out that their counterfactual is morally perverse because it is one in which we deliberately lure poorer students into degree programs where they are less likely to succeed, knowing that that is going to happen, but allowing them to make that choice anyway. Let's assume their best case. Perhaps there are some degree programs for which things like connections, things like your family matter. For example, getting a job in the art world is probably largely a product of nepotism, unfortunately. If this is the case, we are perfectly happy with universities saying we are more likely to accept students from richer backgrounds because they are more likely to be successful. That simply means that the poor students are redirected into the kinds of fields where merit is the greatest determinant of their success. Things like the corporate world, things like STEM, where your family background and connections don't matter, but your ability to program and your mathematical skills do. So comparatively, we think that even their best case is something that we would prefer. Finally, this actually shifts the incentives of universities because 
universities won't just be able to rely on the small number of students that will be able to prove that they will be successful in the job market anyway. The fact that you are successful in your extracurricular activities and have good test scores isn't really an accurate determinant of success in the workplace. In the vast majority of cases, the easier and more affordable way for universities to guarantee that they will be able to maintain their expenses is to just offer and aggressively market the best degree programs to students, which means that you get less obscure advertising and marketing that fool students into believing that they can go into the humanities and still be highly employable. So comparatively, the world is better on our side of the house because the incentives of universities are better. Second area of response on reducing student debt. Before that, the point. Why do students join business frats in college if connections in the corporate world didn't matter at all? Well, I mean, that's actually a reason for us to why connections is something you can get once you are in university, which proves my previous point. On student debt, they say that your brand name and your facilities contribute to your success. If this is true, it will be reflected in student salaries and will be reflected in a greater proportion of income being charged. So that's not a problem. The problem is that universities have not kept up with the times. They continue to rely on archaic notions of name brand recognition, even when the market is far has far outpaced them and relies on things like students' performance within university. So we think that on our side of the house, universities are less able to engage in obscure advertising. Secondly, they say that university capital will fluctuate. First, there are incentives to weather against this fluctuation, which means that you keep pace with the job market. It means that you are more likely to offer the degree programs with the greatest degree of employability. Secondly, there's an incentive to cut down on inflated expenses. Why should universities like Oxford and Cambridge spend so much of their students' tuition maintaining vast premises and maintenance of statues when in fact this doesn't contribute to the student experience? Thirdly, there's an incentive to find alternative sources of funding. Things like university investments into land or or even businesses, or even things like strengthening alumni networks. Comparatively, even if we have lower salaries for university professors, that would be comparatively better because it also means lower tuition costs, which we think means that we increase access to education. Finally, my own argument about why you improve the academic culture within universities. In status quo, universities employ a loose model of academic oversight because they know even if students drop out or perform poorly in university, you can always charge them the same tuition. Now, when, poor, when students perform poorly in university, it directly hurts their profitability and increases the likelihood of fluctuation because poorly performing students will get lower paying jobs. Therefore, on our side of the house, there is far greater academic oversight. There is additional support for struggling students. There is greater student-professor interactions, which increases the likelihood that you get higher marks in university exams, that you are more successful in university as well. Notably, this means that for the most vulnerable students who are the most likely to not have additional support in university, who are the most likely to struggle with this loose academic oversight, are the most likely to succeed once they get into university. Given then that we not only increase access to university education itself, but also increase the success of the poorest and most vulnerable students once they get into university proposed. I thank the speaker for that fine speech and would now like to call upon the Honorable Deputy Leader of Opposition. Here, here. Am I clearly audible? Okay. Yes, yes, you are. You are in the chat. The incentives of universities don't magically change. Just because proposition implements the motion, it doesn't mean that universities become benevolent and want to help struggling students with an angelic heart. The reason why they say things like students have hard times pulling out loans because of things like their credit scores is precisely because universities care about those returns and want to maximize that. Our claim was that on our side, students are, uh, our claim was that on their side, students are unlikely to be able to give back the tuition of the school. We're likely to be cut off entirely. They needed to prove why universities would take that risk in the first place, where they would choose a marginalized student over one from a privileged background. That is precisely what the debate is about. 
two areas of refutation. Number one, what happens to minority students? We told you, the moment at which this motion is implemented, colleges are forced to pick not potential talent that may blossom, take that risk, but rather the guarantee of money return. Since students, as we told you, are in the middle ground, like the middle ground are the consideration, those that get scholarships are probably out of the debate anyway. But the difference was that on our side, students invest in college, pay the, pay the cost upfront, whereas on proposition, Colleges yeah. invest in students to make sure that they receive the absolute gains and profit off of students, meaning that they're unlikely to be willing to take those risks. What are those risks? We told you. Schools are likely to look into your family connections in the business world, where your background is. So marginalized students consistently can't access those same opportunities as privileged ones, which is why from the perspective of colleges, they're less likely to succeed. This isn't a comparison between marginalized students. That is to say, the college isn't saying, oh, if we take in this marginalized student, maybe they have a chance to succeed in the future. This is a comparison between marginalized students from poor backgrounds versus the background of a student with a massively developed and privileged background that we're weighing off. On our side, this is okay. Insofar as colleges know, they're able to collect student loans in the future. And even if their model is true, like the thing about having a fixed percentage of income, note that this still applies insofar as if students don't have high salaries in the future, the college gets less returns on money. For example, if you struggle to find a job after you graduate, if you earn minimum wage, 10% over 10 years yeah. doesn't mean that much money for the college, which means that they actively miss out. They say, oh, this is okay because it's determined by merit now. But the definition of merit on their side is literally how much money a student can make or how much money a student is likely to make upon graduating, which means that you ultimately put marginalized and poor students at an ultimate disadvantage because they have no way to compete against the rich and privileged students that are coming, not rich and privileged students that they're competing against on their side of the house. Recognize that this is also conceded by proposition in their second argument, where they talk about why there's a lot of reasons as to why people might not be able to afford university. I would actually argue this is far worse on their side, since universities now have an active incentive to filter out those students who they think have a risk of not being able to pay that money back. So they're far more likely to check things like your family background, how stable your, the, the income of your family is likely to be, the connections that you're likely to have established already, and ultimately what the chances of you succeeding in the future are. Those are the reasons why marginalized students are missed out on their side of the house. If they cannot get into the university in the first place, our point is that you block them from accessing that education at all. Before I move on, I'll take that point. More so than your family connections, your ability to cope with the rigorous demands of university education are a greater determinant of whether you will succeed after you complete your degree. Why then wouldn't universities overlook the fact that poorer students have fewer opportunities and look at the limited opportunities that are available to them to try to assess their merit on the basis that once you get to university, you are the most likely to succeed and therefore have a higher paid job? Firstly, really long POI, but secondly, like or, or, as we already told you, again, this is not a comparison between like marginalized students, as we told you. So yes, it is true. We agree that marginalized students have the opportunity to succeed in college if you give them the resources, and that is good. That is what happens on our side of the house, insofar as colleges know that they have a guaranteed return from those students. What happens on your side is that, again, you are not weighing off like one marginalized student over another marginalized student. You're weighing off a marginalized student versus a privileged background. Colleges are likely to not take that risk. You you need to prove to me why colleges are likely to make that trade-off and say they're willing to take the risk of letting this marginalized student in, even if it means that they lose millions of dollars. Second area of the debate then on quality of education. Proposition asserts their model, which is that this is a fixed percentage regardless of income. First of all, I'm not sure if they can assert that this is how all universities will do it. I'll talk about this later as well, but let's assume this is true. If it is true that universities are taking in these poor students and you only pay a percentage of your income, regardless of what your income is, so it might be really low, right? That means the college actively loses money. So that means that colleges have less and less resources to invest into a good quality education. Their model is a concession to our second argument. But secondly, we told you the areas colleges invest resources into fundamentally changes. Insofar as colleges lose money, they'll try to maximize and capitalize on practical uh, areas of academics. Since it is a set price for income, that means the main goal of colleges precisely becomes to increase the income of students as much as possible, no thanks to that POI. That means liberal arts schools actively lose funding and support because it's hard for those schools to survive. So that means less 
funding less tuition means less and less quality of education for those schools until they eventually die out. If a student dreamed of majoring in Russian literature, they would struggle to find a school that finds that major to be marketable. This is a direct response to the third argument because their imaginary funding doesn't have anywhere to come from. So that means you actively deter the quality of education insofar as there's a massive cost at risking humanities and liberal arts majors. So, uh, uh, and you don't get a more diversified education on their side. So the goal of education isn't just for students to find high paying jobs, obviously. It's not fair to kill the dreams of those students. No response whatsoever from the speaker before me. Moving on to our third argument as to why students are punished when it comes to paying tuition on proposition. First thing to note in this argument is that like proposition doesn't have the fiat to claim that this motion will be implemented perfectly in their fantasy land. What do I mean? Like they can't say that this is how the world works because we are proposition and set up the debate. That is, they can assume that in their world, universities collect a portion of their income uh, from their graduates on graduation, but they can't arbitrarily decide what exactly it would look like. They needed to logically prove to me why that method of collecting a portion of their income is likely to occur. Note that this motion is being implemented currently in the status quo. The percentage of the income that universities with this policy right now currently take is around 50 to 20% of salary. And for schools like Purdue, like we mentioned in a POI, with their income sharing agreement that has a loan system, it can end up charging students up to two to three times the cost of their education. So it's not a perfectly set time they want where the universities are collecting just the amount of tuition that students were trying to pay. It's a world where universities are likely to share the income of these students, even when that means that the income of universities may oftentimes exceed, exceed the actual tuition of the school. And even if you buy proposition model 100%, they literally concede this because if it is a set percent, if your income is super high, that means you end up paying far more tuition than what the original cost was. Why then is this version of the world likely? Because colleges literally lose money on their side of the house. Instead of students paying the full price of tuition, if they do not have enough money to pay, colleges lose that money, which means there's a huge money gap to fill. Colleges are likely to want to fill that gap. And the easiest way they can do that is by continuing to take away the income of successful students for a longer period of time. This is predatory and almost equivalent to indentured servitude insofar as universities are actively overcharging students and taking away their wealth. Even if you don't buy the entirety of my argument, the alternative of this argument is that proposition is forced to concede that universities have far less money in their world, which the previous speaker like, conveniently ignores, by the way, which precisely means that schools have less and less resources to teach students, attract better professors, and like invest into majors that lose out on their side of the house, and invest into the education of students, which is a huge harm that they needed to defend. Because they harm marginalized students, they do not improve the quality of education, but are more likely to be predatory to struggling students. We're very happy to... Um, What's that? Opposition. Oppose. I thank the speaker for that fine speech, and would now like to call upon the honorable government whip to wrap up the substantive case for the government side. Here, here. Hi, this is Jackie from Audible. Yeah, you're perfectly audible. Uh, I'll take the eyes in the chat, please. three clashes in my speech. First, on minorities and the poor, second, on the cost of education, and finally, I'll talk about the culture within universities. First, on opportunities for minorities. I just want to make an observation about what opposition has given us in this debate. That is, even though they were so quick to criticize us on our counterfactual, there is a lack of counterfactual analysis on their side of the house as to why minorities are able to afford the cost of university education on their side, given that we have fleshed out to you in the framing of first speech that many of these individuals find it hard to have an access to capital or even take out loans due to things such as bad credit scores. So why minorities can afford university and attend on their side Side is still extremely unclear. So what they're doing in essence is running a negative case without any positive impact. Let's be realistic and look at the barriers that minorities face to entering universities in the status quo. First is racism and external biases that exist in society. Second is monetary and financial capacity to enter university. And finally, it's on the ability to display merit and have qualifications, all of which we agree are barriers. So let's deal with each and every single barrier. First then on finance, I want to note that although minorities are unable to garner financial capital to attend university on opposition, because they are uncertain whether the job they take can pay off the debt they accrue in the long term, 
term, you have a guaranteed way of paying for your university tuition costs on our side of the house. Because it is a proportion of income you will definitely earn in the future once you get a job, regardless of whether you get a low paying or a high paying job. So because it is a percentage of already earned income, you will always be able to afford the costs of university. Second, I would note that opposition concedes that universities will pick on the basis of things such as merit and exceptionality, given that they want the most exceptional students, given that they are the most employable. I quickly want to note here that the incentive for universities to favor white rich people with connections to the business world is probably symmetric on both sides of the house, given that these are individuals who even on opposition's world can straight up pay the cost of university tuition, therefore there is an incentive to favor these individuals even on their side of the house. So I would note why that is an exclusive harm on our side hasn't been fleshed out. But note that universities know that even if you are extremely rich, if you are unemployed, if you don't do well in university, you won't be employable even if you have connections because companies want individuals who are brilliant, who will turn them a profit given that companies in and of themselves are profit motivated. So universities have an incentive to pick off the basis of merit. I would note then that merit is able to forego the biases minorities face within society because universities recognize that even if their admissions process may be biased towards black individuals in opposition's world, that bias comes at the monetary cost to the university in our world because not picking members who have exceptional talents within minorities means that you lose out on, you lose out on a demographic of students who are extremely employable, who bring profits to the university. So I would note that we are also able to reduce the barrier of racial and social biases. The final barrier I want to talk about is on the ability to acquire and display merit. And that is how I'm going to break the tie in this clash. The first thing I want to note is that opposition says that minorities cannot demonstrate merit on in the world currently. But that is also a reason as to why minorities won't make it into universities on their side of the house. Because universities want individuals who are extremely talented on either side, given that your like re the results students produce are the way you market yourself and your prestige as a university. So if as a minority you can't acquire things like a good SAT score or good sports extracurriculars, you likely aren't going to get in on their side. But the important analysis I want to make is that minorities are better able to acquire merit on our side of the house because the capital they save up for university can instead be invested into attaining merit. What does this look like? On our side, the member of a disenfranchised community who needs to work a part-time job while in high school to finance his university education no longer has to save that money up in order to pay for university or go to a lower or lower quality university because that's all they can afford. Instead, this individual can use the capital that he or that they have acquired in order to afford things such as SAT tuition, in order to get better scores, in order to afford the equipment for extracurricular activities. So I would note that minorities find it easier to display merit on our side of the house as well as apply to better universities because financial restraint isn't something that occurs in our world in the short term. That is not something they responded to even though they fleshed out the analysis in first and second. So I clearly think that on all three of those constraints that minorities have in the status quo, we are able to break those down. The second thing I want to talk about is on the cost to universities and whether they will have profits and be able to fund their operational costs. The first thing to note is that a lot of people who have university degrees get employed, and this is the framing Ashwin gave you in their speech, and when they explain the importance of university degrees. Even if some people get low paying jobs, some people get high paying jobs, and some people get mediocre jobs, the aggregation of the income stream of your entire student body means that universities get large amounts of revenue. The second thing I want to note is this is a this house prefers notion. So you need to envision a separate world where from the beginning of time universities pursue this policy. This debate is not about the implementation of this policy in the status quo we live in. 
I would note that in this alternate imaginary world, universities would have taken the precautionary measures to ensure that they had large amounts of excess capital. What does this look like? It looks like cutting down on luxury costs, such as taking care of statues or luxury student housing that occurs in universities like Oxford and Cambridge that opposition wanted to characterize. It looks like investing in companies like they do to an extent in the status quo in order to garner returns, but they do it far more in our world in order to garner more capital. So I would note that in this world, even in our worst case, there are ways in which universities shield themselves against the cost. Finally, they give us this ludicrous claim. Oh my God, universities are going to charge 50% of your income. If universities do that, people probably aren't going to attend these universities because they won't be able to afford the cost of living in the future. Universities are competing with one another and they know that people will flock to the universities that have the highest percentages. So the profit incentive they wanted to characterize works against them. Before I move on, I'll take that view you can get a loan for college education, you're unlikely to get a loan for paying for business tournaments. Why is merit so easy to achieve then? You can't get a loan for college education, and that's what we fleshed out in our first speech. Okay, final clash then on opportunities within academic culture. I want to note that they have very little response to the argumentation that came from first and second, which is that you improve academic counseling for individuals during the course of their degree, because you know that if students struggle, they'll be less employable. That after people graduate, you want to improve existing postgraduate job opportunities and networks to find jobs for people. It's not good enough to say that this already happens when we told you that those structures will improve. So no response there, and that is an independent path to victory. However, what I do want to respond to is this idea that you will just get rid of the liberal arts and the humanities. Chanito has already made you responses in his speech as to why some people can still attend these degrees, but even if some don't, it is okay because you get higher paying jobs and that's better for your quality of life. Note that what universities do now is that they mislead poorer students to believe that they will be the ones to succeed within the liberal arts, even though the employability within these fields is low. Look, I recognize that your passions are important, but your ability to put food on the table is more important because there's a tangible harm that arises from it. For all these reasons, propose. I thank the speaker for that fine speech. And now to wrap up the substantive case as a whole, I invite the Honorable Opposition Whip. Here, here. Yep. Um, again, re restating that I prefer verbal POIs and my pronouns are she, her. Um, with that, I'll start the speech in three, two, one. From the very end, to, until the very end of this debate, the proposition has had no real engagement with their worst case scenario, let alone their realistic case that we gave them. We gave them two clear burdens for them to defend from the very beginning. That one, they must justify fueling colleges profit-based incentives in terms of prioritizing accepting students who they think will be able to earn the most. And two, they must justify colleges not being able to make the most efficient use of their resources because they can't predict their income as well as right now. They did not fulfill these burdens as, as they did not recognize one crucial trade-off. They cannot have both the same quality of education in the sense of having enough stable monetary resources to invest as we do on our side, and also say that the amount that graduates will end up paying will not strain them. But even if they bite one of the two bullets for the trade-off, we still have two round winning points that we say will be sacrificed on their side. Firstly, opportunities for marginalized students in general, and secondly, the quality of education. Now moving on into our clashes. The first clash I have for you is the immediate impact on students and graduates. A few points under this. The first thing the government prioritized heavily is that they're going to cut down on student debt. They're going to enable students. And they said that people can apply to better universities with better facilities. But why? If there are more prestigious universities, they're going to need more money to maintain their yeah. facilities. So they would request a greater proportion of income from their graduates. If they don't, the government needs to defend all universities falling to the same level and losing out on the level of talent that these universities are able to hone for the good of society. But then they talked about how in terms in times of economic shock, people can't afford uni and they're dropping out, but on side, on their side, they can. But the same analysis applies. Even if they get the education and try to go into the job sector, economic shocks mean that jobs are scarce or low paying as well. So 
So they will either have to pay a greater proportion of their income or not be able to get a job at all, meaning that colleges will again collapse, cutting off the ability for future generations to earn a livelihood. But even if all of, the, all of what they said is true, they can reduce student debt in the short term. The way off is losing opportunities to get an education at all. This is where we talk about marginalized students. We told you that these colleges will have less incentive to take in marginalized students, and they support this argument themselves when they say, you change the incentives of universities so that they'll no longer focus on these other factors like prestige but rather on the income that students will get. So as profit-oriented companies, if colleges think all you'll amount to is a minimum wage job due to your lower class background, what's the point of accepting you and then collecting a tiny amount of money via the proportion of income every year after you graduate? They wouldn't take in these students because now the tuition they take in will not be a set price, but rather a proportion of their income, which means that if they think their connections or background won't secure these students a well-paying job, they have much less of a profit incentive to accept these people in the first place. Our counterfactual is that colleges will still take in marginalized students, even if these students can't pay all the tuition straight up, these colleges will collect loans from them. So especially given these situations, colleges take in these marginalized students because they know that they will get the full amount of tuition from them anyway. So at least they have this, like an equal chance of getting into college to begin with. The government then responded that this is fine. Poor students will be allocated into other right. jobs like or STEM, where co connections don't matter, and that connections are something you can make in college. This is, again, disregarding everything we said before and assuming that these students will automatically be accepted. They wouldn't accept you in the first place to make these connections because you didn't have them to begin with. The final thing the government had to say was that merit is easy to achieve because you can get loans for college. Again, sure, but how do you get loans for building up your merit so that you can get accepted into college in the first place, right? So what is the way off of this clash? We think we would rather have education and a better job and some student loans rather than not being able to get into college in the first place, not having this opportunity in the first place. This argument is not about genius marginalized people, by the way, who are given scholarships to attend university because they have a high chance of success either way. This argument is about the average marginalized student who works hard to go to college to get some kind of proficiency for a job that will raise them out of this marginalized background. The government fundamentally gets rid of the singular important stepping stone for the most important vulnerable stakeholders insofar as they remove any profit and incentive for these yeah. colleges these kinds of students to begin with, which is why we win the debate from the first clash. Before I move on to the second clash, I'll take a POI. Aside from business connections, what are the incentives does an employer have to prioritize giving a richer student with the same degree as a poorer student the job over that poorer student? That is literally the reason why they have this incentive because they know that this is the only level of predictability they have in terms of how well off this graduate will be, which directly correlates to their profit incentive because it directly correlates to how much money they can get from the proportion of their income. Second clash, the quality of education given in colleges. Let's talk about the government's third argument that colleges would focus more onto lagging students. But why would they spend so many resources on these kinds of students? As profit-oriented companies, universities would much rather spend that money to support the most talented or the richest students, even within the college itself, to ensure that they will reach even higher heights and ensure that they return greater profits via the proportion of their income. Come. In this sense, colleges would actually decrease the quality of education for the students who really need it to invest all these resources in these talented or rich students. The counterfactual in the status quo is that at least this kind of narrative doesn't set the precedent for what kinds of kids are outright prioritizing universities. So again, they lose in the fact that they do not prioritize the most vulnerable students. But then we also told you that on their side, they don't have like a predictable set amount of money to use to invest in the school's education. So they cannot develop and grow in the long-term sense, which means that these colleges might either force you to pay more in terms of your proportional income or just deteriorate. So especially if proposition says that all students will save money right. in terms of income, which is their entire case, they are forced to concede that universities will therefore have far less money in their world, which means that schools will have less resources to invest in their education. But even in the alternative, which is their model, they literally concede that certain students will pay much more than they should have originally. If it's a set percent, and if your income is super high, that means you will end up paying far more tuition than what the original cost was. So they either have to accept that their quality of education will decrease or that even if it doesn't, the students will end up paying much more than their actual income is, which is also either a harm on their side that they both need to take. Then we also told you how does the focus of university education change? We told you that now they're going to focus on what kind of employment will get them the most amount of money for their graduates because again they're profit oriented and their graduates are literally directly their source of income now depending on what kind of income uh, what depending on what kind of job they get. So the diversity of education would drastically in decrease and yeah. only pay 
the jobs that make money, like STEM. The impact is that you will lose the quality of education in general, leading to generations of less competent graduates who will get less high paying jobs due to the fact, uh, due to the first point that we told you in this clash. Or two, students will lose critical thinking skills and important thoughts of morality and ethics that comes with studying the humanities and social sciences and will lose the quality of education and school life that they deserve. So what is the weighing of this clash? On our side, at least we preserve the quality of education for most college students and therefore quantifiably win in preserving the livelihoods of most individuals. So what is the conclusion overall of the entire debate? In the short term, the government further marginalizes the already marginalized students by changing the incentives of colleges in terms of which kinds of students they are more willing to admit so they lose and that they couldn't protect the most vulnerable stakeholders of this debate but even if in the short term they do reduce student debt they still lose in the long term because of this short-term win and that because of this they jeopardize the steady predictable income of universities and therefore their quality of education thereby jeopardizing the competence and livelihoods of generations to come so at the end of the day they lose in terms of scale and the number of individuals they jeopardize as well. For all of these reasons, so proud to oppose. I thank the speaker for that fine speech. And now to wrap up the case for the opposition side, I invite the Honorable Opposition Reply Speaker here, here. Can I be heard, Lily? Yes, you can. At the end of this debate, I would encourage proposition to ask themselves, why do social movements exist? Why do minorities cry out time and time again that the world is unfair and that opportunities are unequal? Why are there massive gaps in payment between minorities and white privileged people? Is it because minorities are innately unsuccessful? Is it because they don't have enough merit? Our claim on proposition was that the system designed on proposition is designed to be unfair for minorities not because minorities were less likely to succeed in college, not because they were less smart or academically inclined, but because they were the side that hoped colleges would take a risk by taking in students from backgrounds designed to cast their ankles when they tried to succeed. This was never a question of do minorities have the opportunity or chance to succeed when they enter college? This was a question of are minorities likely to enter college in the first place? Are colleges, colleges likely to take that risk of choosing the marginalized minority when there's a long list of privileged students from perfect backgrounds ready to enter those universities as well with little to no risk from universities getting their returns? On our side, which is quite obviously status quo, colleges can take these individuals in because of things like the image of the university and stuff like that. This fundamentally changes on our side. By passing the motion, they make the primary issue colleges consider the fact that like when students enter universities, college investing in these students, which incentivizes them to reduce any chance of not re receiving profits, as opposed to students investing in the universities. So really, they never engage in their worst case scenario, which we told you is fairly realistic due to the incentives of these private universities where marginalized students aren't given the opportunity to have this education in the first place. But Proposition acts like the only argument we had in the debate was marginalized students. This is not true. The quality of education offered at schools affects all students, not just marginalized students. We told you, one, Proposition literally has less funding conceded by their line by the fact that they did not respond because of the model they gave you. Even if you believe their model 100%, if it is true that they have a set percentage on their side, that means for students whose income is low, you don't get the full cost of tuition, meaning the colleges lose out. Two, that incentivizes schools to lengthen the period of collecting students' incomes. They need to tell me why it's 10 years. I don't think that's likely to happen in their world. So that means to get the most money off of the successful students, which disproportionately harms the students if they pay like two to three times the original amount of the cost of the university, which is our third argument, by the way, unresponded to. Three, what does it mean if colleges have less money? That means you have far worse facilities, less opportunities or resources or infrastructure for students, less investment into the school, all of which harms the entire student body, not just marginalized students. No response to that. Moreover, we told you that means you directly incentivize colleges to capitalize on practical academia like STEM courses. So liberal arts colleges don't exist on their side. Humanities majors die out on their side of the house. They needed to tell us why those things don't matter. They literally don't respond to over half of our case. I think it's a bit 
too late in reply. The only implicit response you might be able to credit is something we get from their whip, which is that this is a this house prefers debate. So that means the motion was implemented from the beginning of time. So the world might have adjusted. First of all, this is a non response. At best, they're telling us that these majors didn't exist to begin with. So it's fine. I have no idea why this response applies. But number two, you just don't have the quality of education and the educational opportunity we, uh, we, 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 we provide to you on our side. I have no idea why this is not an argument they wanted to engage with. At the end of the debate, we've sufficiently proved down the line down the line, why we are the side that helps minority students, why if you increase the quality of education for all students, that is something that helps the entirety of the student body, and ultimately why universities are better on our side of the house. We're very happy to oppose. I thank the speaker for that fine speech. And now to wrap the debate up as a whole, I invite the honorable proposition reply speaker. Here, here. Cool. Uh, can I be heard? Yes, yes, you can. Great. At the top of this reply, I want to make clear a strategic flaw in the opposition's case, which is a lack of evolution in response. The responses we got to our argumentation in OP3 and OP reply were the same responses that we got in OP1 that Chanidu and Fumet dealt with. And I'll get into this through the clash and point out exactly what this means for our chances of winning this debate in those clashes then. First clash is in terms of, my, uh, is in terms of minorities and the poor. I want to flag here the lack of counterfactual in terms of the proposition, because it is all well and good to say our side is unfair, but if they do not prove why their side is more fair, they cannot hope to win this debate. I can concede that both sides in this debate are likely to be unfair to minorities to some degree because the world isn't fair to minorities. Our analysis proved why our side was comparatively more fair. And the reasoning here was that maybe your access to things like merit is hard, and it is hard for minorities to get it, but it is much harder for minorities to access money, which is the prerequisite to be able to access in university at all. And this is where Humed and Chanidu's analysis on the barriers to access come into play. In terms of financial capacity, our side is better because it is only our side that gives you a guaranteed means of pay, as well as the fact that opposition concedes that employers are already profit motivated, which is a reason as to why they're likely to overlook things like your race, because they want to make sure that you're, they get the best people employed as possible. Therefore, we think it is more likely that universities would also overcome their racial biases. But even if that is not true, here's the tiebreaker. We prove through our analysis that on our side of the house, these people, minorities, have a better chance of being able to display their merit because the money they would have otherwise saved towards going to college is now reinvested in towards the ability to make up that merit. You don't have to work an extra job to save money for college. You can spend that time studying and spend that money if you do earn it on SAT tuition. What this proves then is in terms of comparative, our side is better. Because on our side, when you have no debt, you have a guarantee of being able to pay. Even if it's a larger amount of money down the line, the guarantee is what's important. And the fact that you are not saddled with debt for the rest of your life is important. It is on our side of the house that we provide security because people don't have to drop out to go to college. They aren't deterred from going in the first place. We reduce cyclical poverty. And this is why we're better to access university at all on our side of the house. So maybe it is true that people aren't able to get the best quality of university, but the the biggest barrier to any university at all is money. And we think that even if quality is lower, we get more people education on our side of the house, which is a unique good. But second clash then is on opportunities within universities. And this is where our response clearly didn't, go, uh, didn't get a response back, which is where we said that universities, because this is a this house prefers motion, are unlikely to cut this out of the quality of education. Because if you provide a lower quality of education, people are just going to go to your competitors. Rather, they're going to cut it out of frivolous things in status quo that they spent a large amount on. Statues, saving money for things like alumni funds, making the university look pretty, all of which are things that they cut out on our side of the house in order to meet those costs. But even if it is true that you reduce the quality, we're fine with that because we give more people access to an opportunity at all. So even if you don't have access to the best quality of college, you have access to some quality of college that means you're able to get a slightly higher paying job, put food on the table for your kids and have a higher quality of life. 
The last clash in this debate is in terms of academic culture. And this is where they don't respond back to our response regarding the liberal arts. But we told you that even if it is true that the liberal arts goes away, we are fine with that in a lot of instances because the status quo is one where the liberal arts misleads and coerces the poorest of people, forces them into a situation that is absolutely unfair to force them into. But even if that wasn't true, the tie break here is in terms of the incentive we create to do things like provide post-graduation services, as well as trying to do third argument that proved things to the similar effect that did not get a response. So even if it is true that you have to cut down on some costs, it is unlikely you will do so by cutting these out entirely. You might just teach more employable aspects of it. But even if it is cut out entirely, that's something we are fine with. For all of these reasons, proposition wins this debate. I thank the speaker for that fine speech and thank everyone for an excellent debate. I encourage all of you to cross the floor virtually shake 